I'm sure you've picked up on this uh, by now, but each and every week our, our worship team leads us into the psalm that we're going to be studying by singing it for us, which is, is so appropriate because this is how the people of Israel would, would use these psalms. They would be sung in community. It would be a reminder of, of who God is and how he's working in their community. I'm so grateful just to be led in that way. I feel like it, it, it prepares my heart each and every week as we come into God's word together. I know many of you already know this, but um, I grew up in a home with all boys. Um, Well, I mean, my mom was there, but the rest of us were boys. And uh, I have an older brother, about four four years older than myself, and a younger brother that's two and a half years younger. And we we lived a life of adventure, Um, at least in our in our heads, we did right from some of my earliest childhood memories are these moments out in our backyard or riding our big wheels around the block and, and playing cops and robbers or building a tree fort in our, our, uh, our maple tree um, and stacking it full of snowballs to fend, it, uh, to fend off any impending invaders that were on the way. Right? My younger brother and I, we collected G.I. Joes and we would spend hours setting up in our bedroom this epic battle of, of G.I. Joe versus their enemy, Cobra. And in and, and, and these epic sort of um, playtime battles in our heads was the defense of the innocent. It was the, the advancement of justice with our transformers. It was the Autobots versus the Decepticons because good had to win. Because, because we knew what was at stake in our, our childhood imagination. So from the very outset, as the earliest age I can remember, I had a sense of what justice looked like. What, what it meant for right to to avail and for wrong to be defeated. And of course, as we grow up and as we mature, our, our, our sense of injustice is also honed, right? This is something I've taught my kids from a very early age, that when I'm driving and we're in traffic and that guy tries to pull up on the right and then merge in at the last possible second, that that cannot stand, right? <laughs> That it would be irresponsible to let that injustice. And so like any good father, I I drive recklessly on the tail of the person in front of you to make sure that person cannot merge in and injustice be done. You know, we, we, as we understand justice and injustice in our lives and as our awareness of that begins to be honed, we see moments and things in our lives that that are obviously far more serious and far more involved. Our, our, our experiences of injustice emerge from the plot lines of our childhood imagination and enter into real life circumstances that, that oftentimes force us to deal with some very difficult questions. Situations that, that force us to ask things like, how, how could this be allowed to happen? Who, who is going to step up to stop this? Who, who, is, who is going to intervene on, on their behalf, on our behalf? What, what sort of brokenness exists to allow one human being to do this to another human being? What, what would allow them to treat this person this way? And perhaps most personally, like, why isn't God doing something about it? Or as David writes in in Psalm 10, why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in in times of trouble? So today we're going to look at a psalm that we've kind of titled a a, a psalm of justice. And as we enter into Psalm 10, I want to just give you a little bit of background here because Psalm 10 uh, is, is most likely, Psalm 9 and Psalm 10 are most likely a single psalm. Somewhere in the history of translation, it was separated, but if you look at the, the beginning of Psalm 10, there's no notes to it like there often is. There's no indication of the author. And, and Psalm 9 and 10, most tellingly, are an acrostic. In the Hebrew language, each stanza of Psalm 9 and 10 is a letter of the alpha, Hebrew alphabet advancing through the alphabet. And so Psalm 9, David has been 
citing examples. He's been calling the people of Israel to remember times that God has come to their rescue, that where they have experienced his faithfulness and they're praising God. He's inviting them into an experience of, of remembering and praise. Let's not forget times when we've seen God act in incredible ways, come to our rescue. And then in Psalm 10, we enter in halfway through this poem, David gets to this question. Let's turn to Psalm 10. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read through this. This is it's a little bit of a longer Psalm, but I wanna read through it as a whole and then we'll, we'll unpack it a bit. It begins with these questions. Verse one, why Lord do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in the schemes he devises. He boasts about the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy and he reviles the Lord. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. His ways are always preposterous. You're, you're, you're prosperous. Your laws are rejected by him. He sneers at all his enemies. He says to himself, nothing will ever shake me. He swears no one will ever do me harm. His mouth is full of lies and threats. Trouble and evil are under his tongue. He lies in wait near the villages. From ambush, he murders the innocent. His eyes watch in secret for his victims. Like a lion, he covers, in cover, he lies in wait. He lies in wait to catch the helpless. He catches the helpless and drags them off in his net. His victims are crushed. They collapse, they fall under his strength. And he says to himself, God will never notice. He covers his face and never sees. Arise, Lord. Lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the helpless. Why does the wicked man revile God? Why does he say to himself, he won't call me to account? But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked man. Call the evildoer to account for his wickedness, for that would not otherwise be found out. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his hand. You, Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed so that mere earthly mortals will never again strike terror. You you hear um, David's cry in this psalm. Um, The justice psalms, and in many ways, are, are like we studied last week, they're lament psalms, but where David last week was in this season of personal lament and he's wrestling with God about what he's feeling, this sense of dryness and and God's absence in his life. This is sort of a a corporate collective lament. He's, He's looking at situations of injustice that are affecting the people, people he loves. And he's like, God, what are you, where are you at? What are you going to do on behalf of your people? And so much like Psalm 42 last week gave us a framework for how do we approach God in those seasons of life, I think Psalm 10 and other justice-oriented psalms give us a framework for how do we approach God in the face of injustice. In fact, that's the the overarching question that I I want us to think about this morning. What do we do in the face of injustice? What are we to do in the face of injustice? And I think David provides a a framework for us. And it begins at the very outset. It begins when we cry out to God. That's that's how Psalm 10 starts. It starts with David's honest questions to his God. As he thinks about what he sees, what he's experiencing all around him. Uh, Several years ago, um, when our student ministry was was growing, we had more kids going on short-term trips than than we could handle. And so I recognized that we needed to add another trip. And I had a friend that was a missionary down in Puerto Rico. And I I flew down there um, prior to taking students to kind of scout it out. And and he and and some of the other staff there at this local church drove me around and kind of introduced me to different people. But they wanted me to see some of the areas that they serve. And he drove me 
through a community and it was in the middle of the day and there were women standing on the corner waiting to be picked up by somebody. Not, not out of their choice, not because they wanted to, because it felt like it was their only way they were going to survive. And then he took me to this area where there was just this prevailing like um, uh, drug gang that, that sort of ran this project area where people lived in, in fear and um, you could see drugs being traded on uh, everywhere you looked. Like it was just, he took me to places where I saw poverty that I will never forget. Like where, where I just saw people living in circumstances that although from a distance I knew existed, um, from an experience I'm not sure that I had ever seen and walked alongside of. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, I, I got depressed. In the midst of it, I thought, what? I'm bringing like 25 high school kids down for a week. Like, what are we, what are we gonna do about this? Like, what are we, what, what, how are we going to have any impact in, in altering any of this? And, and, and it left me in this place of, of hopelessness. Like, I just struggled to understand, like, how could this be allowed to happen? How could so many people be suffering in such a profound way? And, and I wrestled with God about this. Again, look at this psalm. David asked the question. His sense is, he says, why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why, why do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in, in times of trouble? And then he begins to develop the source of the understanding where this is coming from. In verse 3 and 4, he talks about the proud person. He says he boasts about the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy and he, he reviles the, the Lord. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. In verse 10, he says his victims are crushed and they collapse. They fall under his strength. He says to himself, God will never notice. He covers his face and, and never sees. See, think for a moment about our, our, our cultural response to injustice. Like I think culturally, we have a tendency to respond in one of, of three ways. The first is we try to ignore it, right? I, I understand this. I think this is kind of a, a side effect of living in a rel relatively affluent culture, a affluent part of the world, but we have the means to be able to kind of cover our eyes and, and, and cover our ears and, and pretend as if we didn't see it, right? So we entertain ourselves, we keep ourselves distracted. So that way, this reality that's happening in the world doesn't impede upon my comfort. And, and, and we just try to look the other way. I think sometimes we do exactly what I did in, in Puerto Rico. I, we just throw our hands up in helplessness. I acknowledge that it exists. It's there. It's a reality. But there's nothing I can do about it. And it's sad. And yet, I don't know. Where do I go from here? I think thirdly, and this is, of course, the most positive, And yet, I, I want to dive into this a little bit. We mobilize. We, we say something has to be done. So, so, there's a problem that we recognize and we want to intervene, but the, the, the thing that I want to caution us here is oftentimes we do that out of the sense that, that again, particularly this can be a, a side effect of living in an affluent culture, is that we've got it figured out in life and let's go tell the broken, poor people what they need to do, right? So we're going we're gonna to fix it. And it's coming from so often a very good place in our hearts, but we try to do it in our own strength. We, we, we try to overcome the problem with our own intelligence and wisdom. And here David begins by just merely bringing this to God. He cries out to God in the face of injustice. He does so with the question, where, where are you, God? And, and remember now, this is a continuation of Psalm 9, where David is called to memory the experiences of, of provision. He's called to memory moments when God has rescued the people of Israel, right? So he isn't asking this question as one who doesn't know what God is capable of, but rather he is asking this question for a, a call to action. It, it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 he's expressing this, this call of covenant faithfulness. God, we've seen you do it before. We, we've seen you intervene on behalf of others. Can you, are you seeing what's going on? Can you intervene? Can you step in and do something about this? I've had times when, uh, 
I'll be with my three daughters and, and maybe one of them is a little out of sorts or throwing a temper tantrum, especially when they were, were little. And, um, and you could kind of get this look from one of your other daughters that would sort of say like, how long are you gonna let this go on, dad? Right? You know that look? Like, how long are you gonna do something about this? Like this is, David is looking, he's coming to God and saying, God, how long are you gonna let this go on? How long is this gonna be allowed to, to happen? I do think it's important here as we think about this to, to identify that David takes the time to identify both the, the source of and also the effect of this oppression, this injustice in the world. Well, I oftentimes think of, of where does injustice emerge from? And often in my head, I'm thinking that the, the root source of it is, is hate or power or greed or lust. And certainly things do emerge from that. But David here in this psalm, he roots it in pride. He, he talks about the pride of the wicked man. And I think verse four, he says, in his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. And in all his thoughts, he says, there is no room for God. So David's saying that the issue here, what's a, what's, what is the source of all of this, this affliction is that for, there's a person who has placed themselves at the center of the universe instead of God. And so people around him now, now they become a means to advance his agenda. The, the other people around him become something to be used in order to accomplish his own goals. And so instead of, of seeing the good gifts that God has given him as a means to bless and serve others, he sees others as a, a tool to be used to his own advantage. And when that happens, the result is always, it's always abuse. It's, it's always oppression. Right? Pride says that God needs to see, that he doesn't hear, that he doesn't know, or he doesn't care. And so the, the proud person operates as if God's not going to step in and do anything about it. And it. It occurred to me this week as I was working through some of this is that I, I can be, I'm much better at identifying and noticing injustice um, in the world or, or my own sort of micro experiences of injustice, I would call it moments where I feel like I'm being treated unfairly or moments when I feel like I'm, I'm being taken advantage of. Like I can, I can recognize those things. I'm not as great at identifying and seeing pride in, in my own heart, my own life. And, and again, I, wanna, I want us to understand that what David is writing, he's talking about something on a macro scale, but this, this can and does happen in individual lives in much smaller ways all the time. I, I don't have to be trafficking another human being. I don't have to be running a drug cartel. I don't have to be the leader of some corrupt organization in order to operate out of pride and therefore um, oppress, uh, abuse, take advantage of other people. In fact, we can do this in much more personal ways all the time. And hear me on this. When I do that, when I operate that way, when I treat my wife or my kids or my coworkers or my friends or my neighbors, when I do that, when I see them as a means to be used for my own advantage, that's unjust. That, that's operating out of pride. I'm, I'm putting myself in the center of the universe as if it, and, and making no room for God. It's, it's for that reason we can... We can both be simultaneously a victim of injustice while also being the perpetrator against somebody else. So, the, so David's psalm here, it gives, us a, it gives us cause to pause, to evaluate our own hearts, to ask God to expose in us those elements. Even simultaneously as we cry out to him, as we look at the world around us, we say, God, where are you going to break in here? But, but begin here. Break, break in here first, expose in me moments, places when I am operating out of, out of pride and I'm taking advantage of the people around me. So it begins with a cry to God. David says that when, we, when the governing authority of our lives is pride, unavoidably the innocent will suffer. The innocent will suffer. 
But David continues in the second half of this psalm. After he cries out to God, we see that his second response, what do we do in the face of injustice, is that, that he models to us that we cling to faith in God. We cling to faith in God. Verse 12, David calls out, cries out to God, Arise, Lord, lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the helpless. Verse 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his, from his land. You, Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed so that mere earthly mortals will never again strike terror. I was, um, I was thinking about how to, how to come at this, and, and it can be, I recognize that I'm speaking on injustice from the platform and position of somebody who's lived a, a relatively comfortable life. Um, I, I, don't, I can't tell you some, I have, like I said, I've experienced what I would call micro injustices, personal moments when I've felt taken advantage of. And, and so it can feel, I think, contrived sometimes when, when I'm, I'm saying, hey, the, the response to great injustice is, is cling to your faith. Right? They can feel easy to say. But I was reminded um, of, of somebody who I think's example modeled that so well and, and, and was ex her experience. Um, and that's Corey Ten Boom. I don't know if you've heard her story. I don't know if you've read some of her writings, but she tells the story of growing up in the Netherlands in the 1940s when Nazi Germany invaded and how right away she began, her and her family noticed that Jewish men and women and families were being persecuted. And so they just, they felt compelled to do something. By 1942 or so, they became a part of the Dutch underground that was seeking to hide Jewish refugees and to transport them out of the Netherlands, get them to Switzerland, get them to safety, someplace where they could hide. In 1944, um, their family was betrayed by a neighbor um, who reported them to local um, German Nazi authorities. And uh, Corrie Ten Boom, her sister and her dad were all hauled off to concentration camps. Um, the people actually that they were hiding at the time um, were able to escape and got away to safety. Um, Corey Ten Boom's dad died within 10 days of, of being in the concentration camp. Um, her and her sister actually lived in the concentration camp for, for years and began all kinds of ministry there. They began taking care of others. They began leading others, work, creating space for worship and, and running a, literally like a, a small church in the, the concentration camp. Um, later, her, her sister got ill and, and passed away and died. Um, Corey Ten Boom, um, what they would later discover, was released by a clerical heir um, about a week before the women in her camp were let off to the gas chambers. Um, and she told the story, and, and people asked her, how did, you, how did you lead people in worship? How did you teach other people about this good God in in circumstances, in an environment that was antithetical to that? How, how did you, and, and I loved her answer to this question. This was her response. She says, when a train goes through a tunnel and gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and trust the engineer. You know, the, 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 the gravity of her experience lends so much weight to those words. What do we do in the face of injustice? Where does David find any confidence that, that, that the current experience that him and the people of Israel are facing isn't going to have the final say? It's in that refrain. That the Lord is king forever and ever, he says in verse 16. In verse 12, he says, Arise, Lord, lift up your hand, O God. This picture of of God's sovereignty. If you remember a couple weeks ago when we were talking about Psalm 8 and David talked about the fingers of God, how that's this, this picture of this personal, careful activity, creative activity of God. The hand of God is a picture of God's sovereignty, of his control. And so David, in the midst of unanswered questions, says, my confidence resides in the fact that he is king forever and ever, that he is the sovereign Lord. See, this... This really, there's two things here that, that I think is important that we understand and that David points out. 
First is that this, this resides for David, this, this sense of certainty, this security, this clinging to God in faith. It's rooted in the character of God. David is convinced of who God is. His confidence rests in the one whose character is the very definition of justice. Remember, God in David's mind is the measuring stick of what it means to, to be just. This is a common theme that the prophets come back to time and time again. In fact, the prophet Jeremiah, he says it this way in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. He says, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have an understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness and justice and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. See, that all of this is, is David is convinced of his character. If, if, if not, if he is not convinced that God is good, if he's not convinced that God is is just, then this entire conversation is really just an exercise in the theoretical. It's an, uh, it's an exercise in futility. But David is certain. He's, he is convinced of his character. And it's because that he trusts the character of God, then secondly, he understands the outcome. He's convinced of the outcome. Remember how David depicted the proud operating as if God doesn't see? So if he doesn't know, he's not going to act, and they face no, no retribution, no, no intervention from God. David comes back at this in his conclusion in verse uh, 17. He says, you, Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them. You listen to their cry. Verse 14, but you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and and take it in hand, what is, where is David's conviction emerging from here? David is speaking truth into circumstances that he does not see or understand or know an outcome for. He's looking at injustice all around him, and, I'm, and he's asking an honest question, God, where are you in this? Why do you stand so far off? But then he comes back to this convention, I know who you are. And I know that you are king forever and ever. So you see, the central, the central conviction of Psalm 10 is this, is that in the face of great injustice, God has not forgotten the afflicted, and neither should we. That in the face of great injustice, God has not forgotten the afflicted, and neither should we, which brings us to this third response in, in this text. What do we do in the face of injustice? We continue to work. We continue to work. In verse 15, David wrote, break the arm of the wicked man. Call the evildoer to account for his wickedness that would not otherwise be found out. See, these first two things here are very overt in, in David's psalm. This third one is, is, is a bit more inferred, but it's also uh, repeated throughout the Old Testament and the prophets and then, and then into the New Testament as well. That the majority of the time when God comes to confront injustice, when he comes to intervene on behalf of the inflicted, the means that he accomplishes that by are through his people. That they're through you and I, again, going back to our cultural response, being mobilized, but being mobilized in his strength, in his call, in an understanding of the work that he wants to do. The Apostle Paul wrote it this way in, in 1 Corinthians, because David, remember, David's writing this prior to the cross. He's writing it prior to the experience of, of history's greatest injustice being turned and used for the, the reconciliation of humanity. David writes this, he says, but thanks be to God. He gives victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. What do we do in the face of injustice? What does it look like? We partner with our God in breaking the arm of the wicked. So I, I want to just, I want to suggest three things here that, 
three ways that we respond to injustice. First, I would encourage you, get to know the afflicted. When you have opportunities to, to do life with somebody who is experiencing injustice, walk with them. Um, again, I can sometimes fall into the, the misnomer that this is a, a distant thing. Um, if you attended Micah 6-8 last night, you know that there's opportunities all around us, that this, is, this happens in nearly every culture, uh, no matter how affluent or, or how uh, um, you, comfortable it is. We get to know the afflicted. Secondly, pray for the afflicted. And again, I'm just reminded that David's psalm, the process for him, it began by recounting God's faithfulness, asking an honest question, and then crying out to God to intervene. I think for us, again, I don't mean this to sound like a trite Christian slogan, like we're, we're going to pray for you. This is an honest response of the heart. Say, okay, God, intervene, do something here, work on behalf of the people. And then thirdly, I think we take action. We, we partner with those who, who work for the afflicted. We, we find ways of aligning ourselves with those who, who are coming alongside where there is injustice in order to bring about justice, where, where there's opportunity to defend those who are being marginalized and come alongside the oppressed and say, we want to be a part of this. We, as, as followers of Jesus, we, as those who have benefited from the great injustice that led to our redemption, we want to come in and speak justice into this situation. And beyond that, we want to live justly. We want our own lives to live in alignment with the character of God. I'm um, thinking back to that That conversation and that condition that I experienced in Puerto Rico, I was going through the day and I just, I was in, the, I was in a funk. Like I just had this sense of like, man, this is, maybe this is just, there's just too much. Like, what do we do? And I was with this friend of mine who's a missionary and I was when this, this pastor at the local church that this is their life. This is their daily routine. They're doing this all the time. And I I eventually began to recognize that as they were introducing me to people and they're telling me stories in their church and they're inviting me to sit down over a meal with some families that, that when I was there driving with them throughout the day, all I could see was the problem. All I could see was these, what felt to me to be completely overwhelming problems. But they saw the people. They, they saw individuals that they could invite to, to join them on a, on a Sunday into community and say, hey, you, you belong here. They saw opportunities to respond to a family in need and say, I don't, you know, I'm not sure how we can help, but what do you need right now? How can we intervene? They saw children that needed to be educated and given a safe place. They saw um, families that simply needed to know that there was a God who loved them and they felt like they were put in there as the church, as followers of Jesus, to be the voice of that. And my, and my heart was, was turned on that day to, to move beyond merely seeing the problem to seeing the people and to being a part of just maybe one person's experience that in, in the face of difficulty, struggle, affliction, injustice, oppression, abuse, to be a reminder and a picture of the tangible experience for them that there's a God who loves them, that, that created them, and who invites them into relationship with them. You know, this morning as we conclude, we have the opportunity, um, as we do at the beginning of every month, to come to the Lord's table. And uh, how appropriate it is on a, on a morning when we're talking about injustice to be reminded that God willingly, the, the perfect innocence of God, willingly took on the cross in order to pay a price that I could not pay. That we come to the, the, the table of Christ and we're reminded of his sacrifice and what he accomplished on our behalf. This history's greatest injustice for our benefit. That we might be an invitation, a voice piece of the character of God and a reminder of how much people are loved. So I'm gonna pray for us in a moment. Our ushers will come and they'll pass the plates grab both cups that are stacked together and hold on to those for a moment. And then I will return and, and guide us in the taking of the elements. Would you pray with me?
Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity just to look into your word and to be reminded and to to, um, enter into David's experience of it here. When he's looking around him and he's seeing things that are, are difficult and unexplainable and he's wondering where you're at in it. And yet we too want to speak truth into challenging circumstances. We want to be honest with our God and, and, and invite you to overcome evil and pride. But we also want to cling to faith in you. And so this morning as we come to your table, Lord, I pray that we would be reminded that the standard of justice is your character. And we are the benefactors of your goodness and your grace and your justice that you took on sin to pay a price that we couldn't pay. Meet us at your table this morning. And we ask these things in your name. Amen.